Story 1. The Stairs One of the strangest things I have ever come across in my job as a ranger was a full staircase in the middle of the woods. There was nothing else around it to show that it was a part, or had been, of any original structure. No walls to suggest. There was once a house there, and there were far too many trees anyway. And finding that it wasn't an exclusive experience was even stranger. Apparently, coming across a staircase in the middle of nowhere that has no purpose wasn't an unusual occurrence, but it didn't make the experience any less weird and creepy. I stood and stared for a long time. The other thing that made the whole thing even more unnerving was just how quiet it was. If finding a set of stone steps, and yes, they looked like something straight out of Game of Thrones, which wasn't odd enough, I would have imagined there would have been signs of life. Birds on the stone, bugs, even moss growing. But there was nothing. Nothing at all. I couldn't resist climbing them myself. Even though they were fairly high and unsteady, I couldn't help myself. And of course, that was when I came across the most disturbing thing of all. Because until now, the stairs had been an oddity, a curiosity. But now, they became something from a nightmare. Because at the very top, on the very last step, was blood. Now, I will add why I was out in the very remote part of the forest. We were helping to look for a missing woman. Search and rescue and the police were doing bulk of the job. But since it was a vast area, and they needed all hands on deck, we all were in. Although she was never found. After I got back to the base and reported no sign of her, but told the team leader about the stairs. The first thing I was asked was, did you climb them? When I replied yes, she told me to never, ever do that again, and also informed me that now, the missing woman would never be found. When I tried to ask her how any of this was connected, she shooed me out of the office and told me to not mention what I did to anybody, and if I did, I would be risking our lives. And that was the end of that. Story 2. Pile of Bones I was out with one of the dogs one day, in one of the very remote parts of the park that I work in as a ranger. There are literally hundreds of miles of forest, and we were about as far in as you could get. Surrounding the edge of the trees, wherever we were, were mountains, some of them with vertical drops that made them look almost man-made. Before you get to the full-size mountains, there were some much smaller mounts of rocks. I say smaller, and they were still the size of a three- or four-story building, but smaller in comparison to the size of the main ones. And again, several of these had entirely vertical frontage and were almost completely smooth too. This meant even an extremely sure-footed creature would not be able to shimmy up there unless they were maybe Spider-Man. And yet, whenever we went over that way, the dogs would always go nuts. Ranger canines are also often trained as search animals and have a very keen sense of smell and aptitude for knowing when something is amiss. They would always, without fail, give the indication that there was something on top of those smaller structures, despite it being almost entirely impossible. One day, the local search and rescue team was needing some practice, and they had the chopper out. Since we are good buddies with the guys, I mentioned this particular spot that the dogs always go mad over. We all had a good chuckle about it, and they decided to land the chopper there, as if nothing else. 
it was a good place, as any, to do a dummy rescue. I asked if I could come along, just to intrigue my curiosity. And do you know what we found? Bones. Nothing else but several piles of human bones. Not full skeletons either, but at least four different bodies worth. Three adults, one child. Three male, one female. All varying in how long they'd been there, from what the medical examiner could tell. There was no way on or off that ledge. No signs of anything else having ever been there. We never did find an explanation for that one. Story 3. Dakota Miller's Disappearance Hi, what lurks beneath. I used to work, myself, in the Forest Industry Service, and I have my own very disturbing 411-styled story. The person who went missing in this little story was a little seven-year-old boy who went by the name of Dakota Miller. You could probably look him up, but I don't know if you'll find anything, as before I wrote this up to you, I looked and couldn't find anything. I'm not sure why that is. But anyway, back in the late 90s, Dakota was a regular little boy who had a loving mom and dad. Apparently what happened, it was said that the family went camping for a week, I believe, south of St. Louis, when the mom and dad had their back turned for just a moment, as many of these 411 cases seem to go, and just like that, the little boy had vanished. It was summertime, so he was seen wearing a dark blue shirt and red shorts and sneakers. They were at the campsite when the boy disappeared. There were no other campers nearby. No possible way he could just vanish like that. The nearest trees were easily 40 to 50 feet away. They were perfectly in the clear. It was as if he had just vanished, evaporated, like he was a vapor in the air. Search and rescue went on for well over 10 days in search of this little boy, when six days, about 200 miles away, they found the exact same pair of sneakers, shorts, and shirt that he had been wearing the day of his disappearance. Only due to the terrain and distance of the finding, they weren't sure if these clothing correlated to the boy. After some research and DNA matching, it turned to be that these were the exact same sneakers, shorts, and t-shirt of Dakota, who went missing only six days prior to being found, at least his clothes. There was no underwear in his clothing. There was also no dirt marks, no scuffs. His clothes were just as clean and as neat as the day he had disappeared. His clothes were randomly found by an older gentleman who was out hiking that day along the upper northern section of Arkansas. Dakota's body and his remains were never discovered. But like any 411 story, the most disturbing thing is how did he go from alive to disappearing so quick? And how? Where are his remains? What happened to him? And now, nearly 20 years later, after trying to look into it more, there is still nothing. It was inconclusive. And after, I believe, the 12th day of search and rescue, they called it off, with the only findings they had were his clothing. That was it. As far as we know, the world, he's just gone. Story 4. Lycanthropy and the Cover-Up I haven't really heard anybody else on your show say this, so I'll say it for them. If you are wanting a quiet and laid-back job, don't become a park ranger. Being a park ranger doesn't put you at the back of the world where you'll be safe and unharmed. No. Being a ranger puts you at the forefront of the line. Marines, National Guard, SEALs. Give me one of those guys for six weeks, and I guarantee you they'll be crapping their pants in ways they never did during basic. Look, the job puts you right at the contact point 
between the edge of humanity and the edge of darkness. As a park ranger, you are the unwitting crosswalk guard because there are always people trying to plunge into the darkness and there are always things in the darkness trying to break through into the domain of man. Now with that little rant out of the way, here's my personal story. Rumors of wild animal attacks in the park began to pile up. People would come out of the park with bite marks, slash wounds that were made by something from the animal kingdom. But a few of the victims reported that the assailant was a man. A couple even went on to say that it was a full-on lycanthropy, the delusion held by a person that they are a wolf or a werewolf. I didn't exactly sign on to take down nut jobs, but myself and my fellow rangers were briefed on what to do if we ever ran into the predator at large, and what we would do if it was an animal, and what we would do if it was a human being. And thus, we were expected to be more alert and vigilant and proactive than we were to begin with. I was out on patrol when I was sure that I saw movement in the trees. It looked unusual. I prayed that it wasn't a predator. I wasn't afraid. I just didn't want to tangle with anything. I readied my service firearm, got out of the car, and called out in the direction of the movement. There was a response. I was met with the face of a man, with hair so long that he would probably step on it if he wasn't careful. His eyes were wide open, to the point they were perfectly round oves. He tilted his head at me in a mocking sneer. His teeth were yellow and pink, and I'm pretty sure that he was completely naked. So, it was a safe bet that he was a nutcase. But I did mind the protocol, and behaved as if he could understand me. I called to him to stand down and stop for a chat. He was waiting for me in a clearing. That beard of his was swaying like brown vines, hanging from an ancient swamp tree. Madness rang out like an emergency siren from his eyes. There was no way that he was a rational human being. I trained my firearm on him and again attempted to talk him down. That's when he projectile vomited something foul and bloody onto me. Stunned with disgust, not only was it obvious that he had spewed blood on me, the contents of his stomach was a whole collection of small fingers, way too tiny to be that of an adult, and the sheer number suggested that he had fed on multiple children. I almost felt that he had engorged himself just for the occasion. As a parent and a new grandparent, the situation had just taken a very personal turn. I gave chase, and this maniac howled long and high. It's not possible to explain just how fast he was. I would be close to catching up, as to get a clear shot, and then he was darting ahead, out of range. I began to feel that I was being toyed with. The madness of the whole thing turned just plain evil, when the pursuit took me out onto one of the playgrounds where plenty of kids were present. Like lightning, the nude, grinning monster had grabbed up a tiny girl by the hair, scrawny as a newborn deer, and sunken his teeth into one of her eyes and bitten it out. When I fired, he had already flung her up in the line of fire, and just like that, she was a one-eyed human shield. Her body knocked me back as she hit me square in the face. When I was regaining myself, the monster was already lunging at yet another child. 
I was able to react in a fraction of the time, only thanks to the adrenaline tearing through my system. Skull fragments flew, and his outstretched fingers went limp before he could wrap them around a boy's small neck. I don't think I've ever fought so hard to keep consciousness. My body was trying to black out, probably to cushion me from the knowledge that I had just shot a child the instant after she had been mutilated by a crazed monster. That's when the thought hit me. Was she even dead? I was beginning to see double. I found her face down in the grass. Her hysterical parents were running to her, turning her over, looking at her eye socket. This might be the most frightening part of all. Somewhere inside of me came the urge to shoot it. She was ruined. She would be scarred. And it was all because I was half a second too slow. One shot ruined. It was almost like I was hearing the thought out loud, like it was being put into my brain. But my brain had finally snapped and I blacked out. I'm not too sure the outcome of everything. Once I regained consciousness, the police were on all this pretty quickly. I resigned after being blackmailed, and I can't give too much details about that. But I know SUVs and men in suits were quick at the scene it's probably no surprise that none of this made it to the news or any news outlets online. And as far as I know, they took that little girl, who by the way was still alive, into custody on their end. Again, I don't know whatever happened, but I don't work in that job field anymore. Story 5. The Mysterious Black Bear The park I work in also has a large camping area. Sometimes, we act more like security, trying to keep people from going into the restricted areas of the woods and parkland after dark. These areas are out of bounds for very good and often uninteresting reasons. Sometimes, there may be rare birds' nests that we don't want disturbed or there's been some torrential rain which has made a certain area treacherous. But, people sometimes like to think they know better. One important thing about the park I work at is there are no bears. No bears at all in the entire area. Not been a bear sighting here for decades, actually. So, when we got a report from a little girl about seeing a really, really large black bear, we were pretty confused, and also thought the girl must be too. I had a good search in the area anyway, just to please the child, and was stunned to find that there were very clearly bear claw scratches on trees where the child had reportedly seen the animal. There was no other evidence, and we searched thoroughly through the whole park for any other signs but nothing. We still have no idea how it would be even possible for a huge bear to appear out of nowhere when there hadn't even been a single bear sighting in the entire county for nearly 70 years. And, even more, how only one small girl could see it. Then it just disappears again. If it had been for the fresh scratches, we would have thought that it was a prank by one of our own animal experts even though they were adamant that it was legitimate. We will never know for certain exactly what happened and how it was even possible. There was talk about it being a ghost of a bear, but that's not something I tend to believe in. However, I really couldn't think of any other possible explanation. Story 6. Not Always Human my patrol had become so sleepy that I began taking the liberty of spending the earliest part of it walking one of the shorter trails. It's technically not a bad thing to do. It just meant that I wouldn't be able to speed off to respond to any incidents right away. But I was coming up on week six 
without any kind of alert. So, I began to relax my approach to things. And yes, Murphy's Law has a way of singling people like me out. I was at the point on the trail that was the furthest from my car, when I had heard a horrible shrieking that shattered the silence of the forest. I was torn between sprinting back to my car and just running to where the screaming seemed to be coming from. But when you're surrounded by trees like that, it's pretty impossible to gauge just how far away any sound is. I opted for doing the whole thing on foot, promising myself that I'd never leave my car behind again. The screaming continued, and I seemed to be zeroing in on it. But when I thought I was going to come up on a source, it would suddenly be another 15 seconds of running away. I wondered if I was having hearing issues, or if the acoustics of the forest were just so unfortunately arranged that that screwed with my perceptions badly. But it kept happening. My urgency began to melt into suspicion. I did the worst thing that any park ranger could do in a situation like that, and I stopped chasing. Instead, I began creeping. I crept up through the tall grasses, ducking behind trees, trying to get as close to the noise as I could before whatever it was could give me the slip again. It worked. Peering out from behind my tree, I saw something that was only vaguely human. From its head to its neck to its shoulders was a stretched membrane of skin that almost made it look like a nun's headwear. Except it was skin. The whole thing was nude and seemed to be of the female persuasion. Its chest was flat and long and pendulous. The eyes were gaping and yellowed. The mouth was something else and it stretched open almost like it was distended unhinged like a snake's jaw, and the unnaturally yawning cavity bellowed another, plaintive cry of distress. The polarity of everything changed in that very moment. I was being deceived, but deceived into what I didn't know. I put one hand on my pistol, just to be safe, and I began to back away from the direction I was heading. The creature, or whatever, swayed, as if anxious, and it let out another, longer, louder cry. I just kept backing up. This caused the creature to scream again, but not in distress. It was the howl of an enraged predator, deprived of a meal. It rocketed toward me, propelling itself through its strides with its knuckles, like that of a gorilla. In the time that it took me to bring my pistol up to an aiming position, the creature was close enough for me to spit on. Luck was on my side at the last possible second. My shot landed right between the eyes of it, and it face planted hard into the ground. Here's the part that might get rejected from being read. I got ready to radio out and tell the office what I had just experienced. But the body of the creature slowly crumbled into a pile of white, pulsating embers that cooled off into gray ashes. I poked at the pile for bones or anything, but there was nothing left. I quickly told the main office that there was nothing wrong, and when they questioned me, I just told them off. I quickly dismissed anything, and told them I didn't feel well. And then, shortly afterwards, I quit that job entirely. Story 7. Real Life Wood Wampas Years ago, back when I was living up in the state of Maine for a few years, I loved to go explore the outdoors. In fact, I made it a thing during the spring and summer to go and try and hike as many trails as I could 
Most of it was to just motivate me to get in shape and stay in shape. Having dealt with extremely toxic eating habits and a lot of weight gain, I figured the best thing for me was to be out in nature, hiking, losing weight. After all, I hated running, jogging, working out. But I loved the woods, and walking almost feels like you're not doing anything, and it's easily one of the best and easiest exercises to pull off. I would usually start walking anywhere between three to five miles a day. I had no problems with it. I loved it. So, in hindsight, it's the reason why I lost so much weight. But on this particular day in July, would stop my progression for at least a month, because whatever I saw scared the living terror out of me. I get there to the trailhead, and I'm getting out of my car when I notice I'm the only one in the parking lot. Even though it was a very small parking lot, but still. It was a beautiful day in late July, and the only other vehicle I could see was a ranger's vehicle, who drove up to me quickly as I was getting my own backpack out the back seat. He called me over and wanted to speak to me, ask what I was doing. I told him I was working on endurance walking, going up the trail, and this one was about a five mile loop, which I told him was perfect. He informed me, and his behavior was very disturbing, that I should try and find a different trailhead in a different area and said there has been some possible animal sightings that were unknown and could pose a threat. I looked at him strangely and asked him, do you mean like wolves or bears? And I'll never forget him looking away, looking down and just saying no, not quite, and just kept referring back to that it's probably not the best idea I choose to hike this path, that it could potentially be dangerous. He was acting really weird, avoiding specific answers and wouldn't answer my questions. I thought the dude was weird. Afterwards, he ended the conversation, drove off, and wished me luck. I was thinking, whatever, dude. So, I walked off and did my thing. I get about four miles down the trail, probably about near an hour in. I was a pretty fast walker. Like I said... I was probably a little over an hour into my trail when I come around a bend in the small trail and directly ahead of me, coming right out of the trees, were two extremely large brown shaped humanoid things walking right towards me at a slow pace. My first thought actually, get this, when I saw these two things, and forgive me because I can't remember their names, but in Star Wars, you have these white yeti looking things, the same creature that I believe Luke kills in episode 5, but forgive me if I'm wrong. They reminded me of that. Big huge hands, humanoid, except they were brown, but they kind of had that same walk, slow and menacing. I immediately turned back around and started running as fast as I could, thinking to myself, if these are Bigfoot, I'm most certainly dead. I'm not sure if it was my endurance at the time or pure terror taking over me, but I ran the extra four miles back to the parking lot in probably half the time that it took me up the trail. Also, I contribute that to the fact that it was mostly downhill, so maybe 20 to 30 minutes. The things, well, I don't know if they ever followed me. I never turned around to check, but either way, it scared the lights out of me. Did I get a real good look at them? No. I saw enough to know that it was no bueno. Nine foot tall, hairy wood looking ape beast humanoid things. Scary, scary, scary. I never did go back to that trailhead again after that and hiked in completely different areas. A few years later, I moved out of the state down to Florida where I still am today. Still, I've gone through some crazy stuff in my life, and nothing at all compares to the terror I felt in that moment and on that day. Now maybe 
I understand why that park ranger was acting so strange. He must have known something. Why he didn't tell me, I'll never know. Story 8. The Scream I was out in the truck once when something really weird happened. I'm a park ranger out in Maine, and if you know that state at all, it is huge and can be quite eerie in certain places. There are tons of animals out here, and one of the most dangerous that I have ever come across are actually moose. They can be very dangerous, but I felt perfectly safe in my vehicle. That was when I heard the screaming. I used to work in California, and I would hear the sound often enough. It sounded like a woman dying, as if she was being violently attacked or murdered. But it was in fact a mountain lion, which, after all, was no less scary to happen upon. But there are not any cougars in Maine, so this really was a woman screaming. I called it in, as there should not have been anybody this far out, except rangers, and I knew there weren't any female staff out and about that day. I then continued to drive around, to see if I could find her, and at this point, I was still sure it was a her, and that she was in trouble. I mean, why would you think anything else? I heard that high-pitched, very female scream about four more times before I came across to an area that I had never been to before. Not even in my vehicle. There are quite a lot of caves and caverns in this part of the park too. Again, I radioed my colleagues, said to come join me. A couple arrived, and we got out and began looking around, specifically the cave openings. We couldn't see or hear anything now, and most of them had rocks or plants growing up around the mouths of the cave, so it would be obvious if somebody had been in or out the way they would be disturbed. All of a sudden, one of the newer rangers, a rookie, shouted that he had seen something up in one of the larger trees. We quickly ascertained that there was nobody up there, but the thing that the kid had seen was pretty weird. It was a purse, a rather large lady's purse. It was empty, but we couldn't think of a single way that it could have gotten that high up and so far into the branches. We kept searching, but never found anything. There were no women reported missing, no purses reported missing. It was just another mystery to add to the ever-growing list of weird stuff that happens out in the woods. Story 9. Ghosts of the Past Not far from the park where I served as a ranger was a barred-off property surrounded by thick timber that served as training grounds for police. It looked like a really elaborate treehouse for gun-loving kids, but no. It was very much for adults, and it was for anything but playing. Elevated land surrounded the setup on all sides, so that there was no chance of a stray bullet harming anybody outside the training ground. Rangers see far less firefights than police do, but most of us do carry a gun, so it came as no surprise that it was decided that myself and my fellow rangers would spend a few hours a day for a week brushing up on our marksmanship. My time slot was taken care of by an officer, we'll call Colette. I was puzzled at the fact that it was just me and her, because I knew that I had seen the others being trained as a group. But you eventually stop trying to make sense of the decisions of your superiors. You know, just like at any other job. Colette was a very admirable instructor. She was patient when she found out that I had the precision of a shotgun. She wasn't much for small talk, 
but she wasn't a stuffed shirt either. She was just there to do her job and do it politely. As the days passed, I thought my eyes were beginning to play tricks on me. I thought I noticed these deep, dark welts on Colette that hadn't been there the day before. She insisted that they had always been there, but I wasn't so sure. I tried to rationalize it away as a simple matter of her forgetting to put makeup on, but they were awful to look at. Some of them looked like sunken in wounds. Then there was this awful smell attached to her, and I'm not talking about discrepancy in hygiene. This was the gagging stench of straight-up rot and death, minus her injuries. She looked as clean as ever. It made no sense that she would smell any kind of way. I kept trying to find a way to bring it up before I would end up vomiting in front of her. But I just couldn't. The last day of training, everyone would be trained together. All groups, all instructors. Colette was the last one to show up, and she had turned an awful color since the day before. One of the other park rangers was now visibly shaken to the point that he was turning colors himself. Colette acted like she was seeing a long-lost friend when she caught sight of him, and she moved in for a friendly hug. But he recoiled in disgust. Colette shrugged, and she shook me by the hand and led me off to a far corner of the training ground where trees grew very dense together. She told me that she enjoyed her time with me and that she knew she could trust me with what she was going to show me next. My fellow ranger from earlier raced over to us and was absolutely out of his mind, stammering and trying to shoo me away from whatever it was that Colette was going to do. I was confused. I told him to shut up, and I'd be with him in a moment. This made him worse. He seemed to be getting desperate. He aimed his pistol right at me. He was the portrait of a man who had become completely unglued. Yet another ranger had followed us, suspicious of the other's dramatic behavior. Dramatic Ranger took a round to the thigh from Suspicious Ranger, causing him to drop his pistol. I was grateful and took the piece before Dramatic Ranger could get it back. Colette had me move some medium-sized rocks from a depression in the earth. I wasn't surprised to find what I found. There were bones complete with tattered clothing and a badge that had Colette's name on it. There was a second badge, one that must have ended up there on accident. It belonged to Dramatic Ranger. I looked up at Colette, who was smiling at me, looking both sad and pleased with herself, and then she vanished. Suspicious Ranger denied seeing Colette at any given time. I grilled him over it, asking him who had just been taking me out to training all week. He figured I just prefer to train by myself and thought I was just kind of a bamf for it. The body indeed turned out to be Colette's, and Dramatic Ranger confessed to be the murderer from a few years back. Others remarked at how he had lost his badge, like he had a way of losing everything else so it didn't stand out as something unusual for him. He went to prison, which left me, the only other person that had actually seen Colette. My drinking habit got a little worse after that. I never was the supernatural or superstitious type, and there was honestly no way to explain what I had just experienced for an entire week in materialistic terms. So... Here, have a story. Nobody, which I understand can confirm or deny the events but me. But it's hands down the most terrifying realistic experience I've ever had with an actual ghost.
of somebody once living. I never did believe, but now I firmly do. Story 10. The Faceless One of the most frightening things that I have ever experienced was on a nighttime shift as a park ranger. Now, to be clear with you, I work in the UK. We do not have many predators like bears, wolves, pumas, etc. The scariest creatures I have come across are vixens who are in season. They scream like they are being attacked as they also do when mating, and a badger who appeared out of nowhere and scared the life out of me as he very obviously hadn't missed a meal in quite some time. But, shrieking foxes and fat badgers are par of the course. They might give you a shock when you're out and about, but they won't follow you home and haunt your dreams. That particular attribute is saved for the faceless man, and I'm not the only ranger to have seen him. My own experience came one night, when I was out on the moor, just making a routine patrol of the entire area. We don't tend to get many waifs and strays up here. Too cold. Sometimes we do get notified to keep an eye out for the odd runaway. But 99 times out of 100, we never see a thing. It was a particularly bleak night. Cold, wet, and I was dying to get back to the office for a much needed cup of tea. And that moment, of course, was when I saw somebody run past the van. And that sight alone was enough to shock me as I rammed on the brake to make sure I didn't hit him. He didn't even seem to notice me. He just kept running alongside the road. At this point, I didn't think anything supernatural was happening. It was just some bloke out running, although that alone wasn't a good sign in this weather, and there was no way you should be on the moor in the dark. So I started up the van, and I followed. It only struck me afterwards that I, in a vehicle, should have easily caught up with him and overtaken a person on foot. But this chap was really fast. When I eventually caught up to him, after a few moments, I pulled alongside and must have been doing around 40 miles an hour, just keeping pace. I rolled down my window and called over to him, asking if he was okay, suggesting I give him a lift home. Then he turns and looks at me. Well, I presume he was looking at me. You see, he had no eyes. Or face. It was just a blur. The man himself seemed corporeal. He wasn't transparent or anything, like I would have presumed a ghost would be. Everything about his body looked real and solid. He just didn't have a face. Just a head with a fuzzy, blurry pixelation instead of facial features. It was a good job that the road over the moor was totally straight and I had nothing to crash into, as right then, I was so freaked out that I would have hit something for certain. He seemed to speed up even faster and then turned off the road and zoomed off down the moor. I'm not embarrassed to say that I was terrified right then, and raced back to the office as fast as I can manage. I'll never forget walking through the door, and the supervisor taking one look at me and switching the kettle on. I guess you saw the no-face runner then, she had said. It seemed that most of the team had come across him, at one time or another. He never tried anything didn't appear to be an omen or anything, but you can never catch him. If you tried to drive or run after him, he would disappear. Most sightings of things like this 
have some sort of legend attached, so you at least can make a guess as to who the person is, was, and why they're there. I mean, it would have made sense if there had been some sort of hit-and-run accident, and there had been the man killed. But if that was the case, it had never been reported, which in its own right was highly unusual. We never had any reports from members of the public either. It only seemed to be us, the members, us rangers, who got to see him. Very mysterious indeed. Story 11. Suicide Ritual It had been hitting the news around our parts that various landmarks had been disappearing from the tourist route that ran through our corner of Texas. The thieves had targeted nothing but old-time fast food joints that had those oversized cartoonish fiberglass sculptures as part of the storefront. Hot dogs with jolly faces and arms and legs Pigs, that looked like Porky, wearing chef hats and aprons. Stuff like that. Things from a time when America was really America. Well, these things are getting lifted, and the crooks were getting away with it so far. As a park ranger, somebody who thoroughly serves in the forest industry, it would be a stretch for me to make a connection between any of those disappearing sculptures and my day job. I forgot about those reports almost as soon as I had heard about them. While on patrol on one of the trails, my vehicle was suddenly under fire. Bullet holes were punched into the hood. The windshield was spiderwebbed. I threw the car into park and ducked down, radioing out for help and got a confirmation I thought about the gas tank, which had just been filled up, so it was going to be a bad idea to sit in the car. A few more holes punched into the passenger's side, so I took the chance of getting out of the car on the driver's side. Backup arrived and long story short, we nailed the shooters without much trouble. I kind of figured they had been on a suicide mission of some sort and just wanted to go out with a bang. I turned one body over and looked into the face of a man who had painted his face something like a cartoon rabbit. The sort of thing kids would do at a carnival. Except this was a 30-plus year old man. The other shooter was painted to look like a smiling pig. Looking around the pocket of timber that they had been shooting from, we found the missing fiberglass sculptures reported about in the news. They were dressed up in hoodies and jackets and bathrobes and arranged in a large circle around the mutilated body of a beautiful young woman. At the feet of each sculpture were alternating red and black candles. It turned out the woman had been beaten, raped, and mutilated. The blood was found inside a repurposed bleach bottle. Some of it had been poured on each sculpture, staining their improvised clothes. The sculptures were tediously identified and hauled off to be held until the rightful owners could get them. At the time, I didn't think there would be any more to the story. And I hate to say it, but grisly things like that add to this place's popularity and our section of the state was kind of hurting for tourism and commerce. I know, it sounds incredibly cold. I am divorced, if that says anything. So, each sculpture ended up in the right place, and it was celebrated in the news. Not long after, it was reported that the restaurant owners were throwing the previously stolen sculptures away, some of them even being burned. Only a couple of the owners were even willing to give a statement, and they were vague about it at best. They said something along the lines of it, of it not feeling right, or they must have been cursed. 
strange things have happened since sculptures came back, none of them being good for business, despite the spike in traffic because of notoriety. The stories that weren't revealed in the news were whispered throughout the community in the years to come. It certainly was one of the strangest experiences of mine on the job, and really one of my only hand-to-hand -hand experiences with the occult. Story 12. The Great Search One of the worst times to be a ranger is in the winter, especially if your area is up in the mountains. We do our god best to tell people to stay away. Snow is dangerous, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Not just avalanches and heavy drifts, but there are all sorts of other dangers, like tree wells and things that appear solid but are apt to give away and have you plunge to a very painful death. Of course, we still have to go out and about and check the terrain and on any animals out there too. Most, of course, which are hibernating, but it is still a part of the job to make sure they are safe too. And that was when we got a call to say that a family, dad, mom, and two little girls had gone up the mountain and not come back. Neighbors had called the cops after they had been missing for a couple of days. The dad had asked the neighbor to let the dog out but assured her they would be home in time for dinner. When they weren't, she did not panic right away, but when they weren't back for the following day's dinner, she called the cops who alerted us and sent out search parties. We found the parents almost straight away, at the bottom of a ravine, both crumpled and bloodied, and, well, very dead. No sign of either children, the weather was horrendous, snow still coming in strong, and it was making it next to impossible to look for tracks. We searched all the caves and caverns in the area, anywhere they may have crawled into for shelter, but nothing. After another two days of relentless snow and futile searching, we gave up. Even if they were there, they were most likely frozen, died due to exposure. As awful as it sounds, we resigned ourselves to the fact that they would likely turn up when the snow began to thaw. Well, a few days later, we did find one, completely by chance, when we'd been out to check on one of the caves where we knew there was a young family of bears. Although in the same park, this particular cave was roughly 20 miles from the spot where the parents' bodies had been found. It would have been almost impossible for a small four-year-old child to get through the snow and make it over that way. And yet, there she was. Not a mark on her. Thankfully, the smell of her had not woken the bears. She was, of course, dead but appeared completely frozen, not injured. During the autopsy report, it was discovered that fish and berries were in her stomach, which had been consumed just a few hours before her dying. As for the other child, she was never found. She simply vanished into the snow and, well, never returned. There was another full-scale search for the body after the thaw began. They even searched for bones in and around the caves in case she'd been dragged off and eaten. All that was ever found was one of her snow boots and one glove, both of them miles apart from each other. The boot just in the middle of a path and went and led nowhere, and one glove at almost the very top of a fir tree there was no trace of blood or any other evidence on either. It remains an open case to this day. This happened almost five years ago, but even now, when I'm out on one of my patrols, 
I always keep a lookout for her, or any other part of her, or her clothing. She is by far not the only person that goes missing. Not by a long shot. Something happened to these people. Something, or someone takes them. Or they're experiencing something we will never have an answer for. Is there some sort of monster out there? Do parks act as some kind of beacon to UFOs? I don't think we'll ever know for sure. But I'm 100% certain that somebody knows what's going on. If you or someone you know has a story or encounter they would like to share with me, please send it to stories at wetlurksbeneath.com.